the title we decided to give to our session today is Cosmopolitanism and Democracy. But maybe you saw that in the program, uh, the previous title was Cosmopolita Cosmopolitanism from Kant to Ecological Interpretations, who has the right to political dignity. Catherine Colliotelen is a professor at the University of Rennes and a senior member of the Institut Universitaire de France. Her field of research covers Max Weber's work, political philosophy and epistemology of so social sciences. Among other things, she authored various books on Max Weber, such as Max Weber and History in 1990, in 1992, The Disenchantment of the State from Hegel to Max Weber, and she also recently published a new French translation of the famous text Wissenschaft als Beruf and Politik als Beruf, Science as a Vocation, Politics as a Vocation. From 1999 to uh, 2004, she directed the Mark Bloch Center in Berlin, a central institution in French-German intellectual relationships. One of her last books, published in 2011, and one of the main reasons we are so pleased that she is here today with us, is La Démocratie sans Demos, uh, also published the same year in German, uh, Démocratie ohne Volk, and um, this year in English under the title Democracy and Subjective Rights, Democracy without Demos, where she addresses the relationship between democracy and citizenship rights. Without further ado, because I know you intend to tell us yourself more about the main topics of your book, <coughs> I leave you the floor. The title of your conference today is Democracy Between Powers and Rights. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation in the Institute to is that okay that way? Do you hear me? Okay. Yes? Okay. So I will read my paper. I still belong to st still belong to this generation of French people who don't speak very good English. So that is some trans transformations now, but I have a I speak German, I have learned German in a school, never English, so... Okay, I hope you, you will be able to understand me. Okay. The title of my presentation is Democracy Between Rights and Powers. I will first resume the thesis I defended in this book, uh, published in, oh, it has already been said, concerning the nature of modern democracies. The central point of my thesis is that we should give up interpreting modern democracy as equivalent to the sovereignty of the people. This equivalence has indeed been established only at the end of the 19th century. At the time of the French and American revolutions, the new political regimes that those revolutions were founding were generally not thought of as democracies, partly because the word democracy still had the old meaning of one of the three types of government, government in the traditional typology. But more important to my thesis is the fact that the connection we usually make today between democracy and the actual participation of the citizens in the process of lawmaking, so the vote, was not evident in the first decades of these regimes. This connection is the product of a process of democratization, which has taken place under the pressure of the claim for equal rights. This principle put an end to the regime of statutory rights, which were linked to membership in a particular group. One of the major accomplishments of the modern states has been to eradicate, eradicate those differential rights by imposing a law which should be the same for all. This is the meaning of the first article of the Declaration of Rights of 1989, not that, that all human individuals are naturally equal, but that, that they must enjoy equal rights. 
This is my first point. I have nine points. Second point. We can call democracy the political institutions that are based on civil liberties and the selection of legislators and political leaders by the universal suffrage. But these constitutional arrangements do not grasp what has been the driving force behind the democratization, namely the claim for equal rights. I agree with Etienne Balibar, I quote him in a recent published book, uh, Libre Parole, by Galilee, uh, just published. I, quote, uh, uh, I agree with Etienne Balibar, whom I quote here, rather than a regime in the formal sense, democracy it is what names a moment in the life of the people destined to remain informal. What me, I quote, what we must call democracy is not the form of a constitutional power, but the tension between the processes of democratization and the processes of de-democratization, end of quotation. In the same line, the American political theorist Sheldon Wallin argued some years ago that, I quote again, democracy in the late modern world cannot be a complete political system. System It needs to be conceived of as something other than a form of government. End of quotation. The democratization of the political regimes that are issued from the revolutions of the 18th century was driven by the claim for equal rights. But only, it, uh, important point for my thesis, only the recognition of the claim by a power that is able to guarantee it converts the claim into an effective right. Therefore, the claiming for rights presupposes a power to which it addressed to demand this recognition and guarantee. I can on this point again later. Point three. <coughs> During the 19th and uh, uh, 20th centuries, the governments of national states were the main powers to which claims of equal rights could be addressed. Under the di direct, or in, uh, uh, direct or indirect pressure of disadvantaged social strata, the negatively privileged in the words of Max Weber or the sans pas in the words of Jacques Rancière. Under this pressure, political rights have been extended to all citizens. The distinction between active and passive citizenship was abandoned, first to men, later to women. Under this pressure again, new rights were instituted, social rights, which partially compensated for the inequalities linked to the structure of capitalism. Since this extension has taken place in the frame of the national state, it had resulted in the formation of a new kind of status, national citizenship, thus making the rights of foreigners problematic. Hence the famous aporia highlighted by Hannah Arendt but uh, I will not comment it today. My uh, point four. The conditions for guaranteeing rights have been substantially modified by contemporary globalization. It is important to understand globalization in all its dimensions, which can be roughly divided into three parts. First, the economic dimension, the development of transnational companies outside the control of states and the rise of financial capitalism, which, unlike industrial capitalism, has no territorial roots. Secondly, the political dimension. In the end of the First World War, and even more so since the end of the Second World War, many supranational bodies at regional or global level have been created, the uh, United Nations, the European Union, and other organizations like the Organization of Af African Unity, and so on. This political institution, we must include into the, uh, this uh, political institution also bodies 
that are economic from the point of view of their competence, expertise, but that were created <coughs> by, by international treaties. That is at the initiative of uh, political authorities. I mean, for example, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, created uh, originally, it was the International Bank for uh, Reconstruction and Development, created in uh, uh, 1945, uh, and uh, now the World Bank, the GATT, which became the WTO in 1995, and so on. We must uh, include into this political uh, supranational institution also NGOs, at least some of them, that is transnational organization from civil society that are large enough to influence political leaders at national or supranational level. They are also parts of the, political, uh, the global political landscape. Finally, so first dimension, economic, secondly, uh, political, uh, uh, finally, uh, well, uh, finally, a legal and judicial dimension uh, I named the increase in the number of declaration of rights of regional or global scope, international convention by which signatory states commit themselves to guarantee these rights, bodies linked to this convention responsible for monitoring their effectiveness like the European Court of Human Rights or the International Criminal Court created in uh, 2002. This list is obviously sketchy and oversimplified, but a rule book would be needed to describe the extreme complexity of international and transnational institutions and also to describe the way uh, international and supranational uh, institutes inter interconnect because uh, supra and transnational that's two different things. At the end of the last century and at the begin, beginning of the 2000s, the idea was widespread that the era of nation states was coming to an end. The first element that fed this idea was the increase, of in, uh, increase in transnational interdependence and the growing power of financial markets, which drastically reduced the options for national politics. From this point of view, the post-national meant the end of politics. But there were also more optimistic interpretations of the post-national which grounded on the development of supranational political and legal institutions, for instance, the uh, ICT, the International Criminal Court in 2002, according to this interpretation, a cosmopolitan organization of the world was possible. The most optimistic authors thought that this cosmopolitan organization could take on a democratic form. Jürgen Habermas is the most famous among these authors, grounding on Kant, he conceives this cosmopolitan organization at the taming of the politics uh, by the law or uh, at the pursuit of the submission of the political power to the law on the worldwide scale. In his book on the constitution of Europa, to verfassen Europa, uh, it has been published in German in uh, 2011, pretty late indeed. Um, uh, he still proposes to understand the EU, EU uh, sorry, as a first step and as a model for a cosmopolitan democracy. Point five, despite Habermas, the possibility of democratizing global governance through political institutions is less and less credible today. The most frequent interpretation for the failure of democratic cosmopolitanism attributes this failure to the resistance of national sovereignties. The revival of nationalism that we are witnessing today seems to indicate that the prognosis of a decline of the nation state in favor of supranational institutions was wrong or at least premature. This analysis is questionable. 
It is true that the principle of national sovereignty, which remains one of the pillars of the international political order, has always been and still is a major obstacle to the universalization of legal protection of individual rights. However, the relationship between sovereign states and supranational institutions should not be interpreted as an opposition. The principle of nas national sovereignty is not called into question by the constitution of international political institutions, which have been created, as the term indicates, by treaties between states. This applies both to purely political institutions such as the UN or the European Union and to institutions whose expertise concerns only the economy, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO. <coughs> the power of these institutions rests on the consent of states. The opposition between the power of nation states on the one side and that of supranational institutions, for example, between EU on the other side, for example, between EU member states and Brussels, does not reflect the complexity of their relations. As far as international institutions are concerned, their multiplication and their rise in power do not correlate with a general weakening of the power of nation states. This is a post-national thesis, but with, of the, with the transformation of the ways in which this power, the power of the nation state, is exercised. Nation states might do it directly, exercise this power directly, or through international institutions, which of course implies unequal relations between states, the most powerful are better placed to determine the decisions and regulations emanating from these supranational institutions, for example, in Europe, Germany, for the budgetary constraints imposed on the EU member states. For the weaker states, on the contrary, these decisions and regulations are external constraints undermining their sovereignty, exemplary case of Greece in 2015 and still now. Point six. This reason, among others, lead me, leads me to interpret globalization in its various dimensions, not as a reduction of the power of national states in favor of supranational powers, whatever they may be, but as a new topology of powers on the global scale in which nation states remain important <coughs> actors. However, they are, not, they are no longer the only ones. They are in competition, more or less conflict, conflictual depending on the case, with other powers, which now are not only other nation states, <coughs> as in the Westphalian representation of the international order, but also, they are, uh, those, those powers are also uh, those international or transnational economic, political, and legal bodies, with, which I have briefly mentioned above. The nation, so to assume the nation state is not dead, it is not even accurate to say that it is dying, but the Westphalian world has died. And at the same time, the power of the nation states is no longer that of the sovereign state that as Hobbes has theorized it, nor can it be interpreted in Max Weber's term, terms as the monopoly of legitimate violence, which meant by Weber the monopoly of the guarantee of rights in a given territory. Point seven. This interpretation of globalization makes it possible to think of cosmopolitan democracy in a very different way from that 
of the cosmopolitan constitutionalism. Global political organization that could be democratized by reproducing more or less at its level. Institution designed on the model of those of democratic states, parliamentary representation, elections controlled by public opinion or by civil, a civil society constituted at the global level, etc. Uh, a global political organization of this kind is totally improbable. But if we stop conceiving of democracy as a political regime based on the sovereignty of the people and even Habermas today doubts the possibility of a global political people, global political people, if we give priority to the idea of democratization through equal rights or through the equalization of rights, it is possible to revive the democratic demand, l'exigence démocratique, to put it in the terms of Etienne Balibar, the democratic demand in the context of contemporary democratization, uh, globalization. The important point is the articulation between the demand for equality, which I believe, uh, once again, uh, is at the heart of modern democracy, and power. A claim is a request addressed to a recipient. In the case of a claim for right, this recipient must be a power that is able to transform this claim into a right. In the Westphalian world, this power was a nation state, the Leviathan of Hobbes, the body with the monopoly of uh, legitimate coercion by Max Weber. In the post-Westphalian world, the number of potential recipients of rights claims has increased. For the ordinary citizen, it is true, the nation state remains the privileged recipient, the first one, the privilege. But it, it is also possible to apply to supranational uh, bodies to accept that a determined state does not, uh, to, sorry, to accept rights that a determined state's state does not respect. For example, in the case of the European citizen, it is possible to apply to the European Court of Human Rights or to the Court of Justice of the European Union. The European Court of Human Rights regularly condemns France, for example, uh, because of the situation in the French prisons. Okay. Point uh, I, I could uh, I could give uh, I could give. It's possible to give other examples, but I don't, don't have them here. So point eight: <coughs> the examples taken from the legal and judicial world are relatively simple. However, they do not exhaust the possibilities of acting for equal rights in the post-Westphalian world. The modalities of action must be adapted to the variety of powers that constitute the new topology of powers. Some of these modalities are within a legal framework, others are not. They include, these modalities include, for instance, anti-globalization demonstrations that accompany, accompany meetings of major international economic organizations or world summits of major states. You have, uh, there are a lot of examples in the recent uh, past against the uh, WTO in Seattle in 1999 uh, on the occasion of uh, the different G, G8, G20 uh, uh, summits in Hamburg in July 2017, again the European Central Bank in Frankfurt in 2015, again the COP21 uh, in France in November of the same year, and so on. These modalities include also demonstration at local level since today economic inter inter sorry, interdependencies are such that local problems are generally linked to transnational phenomena, for example, the possibility of company allocations. Denunciation campaigns conducted by an NGO that use social networks, 
the politics of shaming must also be counted among the different ways of acting to defend and promote equal rights. I do not mean to say that all demonstrations protesting against uh, <laughs> politics conducted by uh, official authorities are inherently democratic. They are so only to the extent uh, that they are inspired in a more or less confused way uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by the demand for equal rights. In particular, manifest manifestation of hostility towards migrants, even if this hostility originates in the impoverishment of local po uh, populations, cannot be considered democratic, in my way, in my <coughs> interpretation. But each case requires a specific and differentiated analysis, and I cannot here uh, engage in this casuistry. Point nine, the last point, a bit longer. I recall my two first points. Central to the process of democratization is the relationship between rights claims made in the name of equality on the one side and power that can convert these claims into effective rights by granting them on the other side. This general thesis calls for reflection on the concept of power. I give here some elements of an ongoing research project. I just indicate the, the topic at the end of my book. I call here powers any institution or, or organization whose, act, whose activity influences the rights of individuals. The term can therefore be applied to political, legal, or economic institution, institutions as well. The use of this concept power faces a twofold difficulty. The ambiguity of power from the point of view of the rights of individuals on the one hand and the <coughs> heterogeneity of the powers, plural, uh, that exert an influence on these rights on the other hand. First, the ambiguity of power, singular, which can be protective or coercive. Some institutions are primarily, if not exclusively, protective, such as legal bodies specialized in the protection of human rights, while others are essentially coercive, such as a dictatorial political power. There are also powers, and a lot of them, that are both protective and coercive. This is the case of the modern state. Part of the political, liter political literature insists on its coercive nature, which makes the state a threat to freedoms. <laughs> the, 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 the liberian the theorists, the anarchists, and so on. While other authors, for instance, republicans, emphasize its protective nature. Both aspects are indeed inseparable. They are the two sides of the same coin. The state must be coercive in order to be able to guarantee rights, and it can become a threat, a threat to freedoms because it is coercive. So it was the ambiguity of power. Secondly, the heterogeneity of the powers, plural, that constitute the global topology of powers of our time, what uh, some author name the material constitution of the world. We can take advantage here of conceptual distinctions borrowed from Max Weber. The distinction Weber made in the fundamental concept of sociology, the opening text of, uh, of his major work, uh, Economy and Society, is well known. Weber defines power, an amorphous concept, as he says, as, I quote him, the likelihood that one person in a social relationship will be able, even despite resistance, to carry on his own will, regardless of the basis on which this likelihood is based. And 
he defined domination as, I quote again, the likelihood that a demarcated command will find obedience among a specific circle of persons, end of quotation. The uh, important difference is the mention of the command. It is not, uh, as we, you probably know, it's not power, but nomination understood as a specification of the power based on the relations between command and obedience. This is domination in this sense. Uh, that is a fundamental category of Weber's political sociology, the politic, uh, sociology of domination. Okay. However, more interesting for my present purpose is another distinction which Weber made in, a, in an earlier version of the sociology of domination. This is a distinction between, between domination by constellation of interests on one side, and domination by virtue of authority, that is power to command and duty to obey. Secondly, okay. The second time, uh, sorry, second type, domination by virtue of authority, that is power to command and duty to obey. obey. This second type is the one to which Weber finally reserves the name of domination in the definition of the fundamental Cat, uh, concept of sociology. The first one, clearly, so domination by constellation of interest, the first one clearly applies above all to power relations that are built up through the stru structural constraints of the market economy. In short, the position between domination by constellation of interest and domination by command covers by Weber the opposition between economic and political powers. This distinction is useful to precise the conditions for the defense of rights in the current state of the world. Provided, however, however that we acknowledge the transformations brought about by contemporary globalization. The boundaries between politics and economics are no longer as clear-cut as they were in Weber's time. The cosmopolitan theories of the type exemplar, exemplar, exemplified by Habermas remains trapped in a dualism between economy and political institutions that no, that no longer corresponds to the current state of the world. Habermas mentions economic globalization only to invite to restore the control of politics on the markets. This position ignores the intertwining of economic and politics today. Institutions, as I already said, institutions such as the IMF, the WTO, central banks, national ECB, World Bank, illustrate this intertwining between politics and economics. Markets may constrain, constrain national governments, but the liberalization of the markets, the constitution of transnational companies, and the development of financial capitalism has been made possible and has been initiated by the politics of some states and of international institutions created by state governments. The attempts of these institutions to regulate markets are not intended to restrict the power of the markets, but simply to prevent them from collapsing. <coughs> there is still a difference between authoritarian powers, I mean authoritarian powers in the sense of Mark Weber, that is powers which command obedience, rules who command and obedience. The, uh, there is still a difference between authoritarian powers and structural powers, or as some people say, uh, hard and soft power. So, uh, social powers which determine indirectly through so the virtue of constellation of the constellation of interest the behavior of the individuals, but this difference no longer coinc coincides with the difference between politics and economics. So. I would like to cite uh, at the end of this presentation uh, 
uh, Susan Strange, I don't know whether you know her, she's an American political science, scientist who has founded a field of research called international national uh, political economy, but there are different uh, concepts uh, of uh, what international uh, political economy must be. So she's the author of a book entitled The Retreat of the State, The Diffusion of Power in the World Economy, the French translation, uh, Le Retrait de l'État, La Dispersion du Pouvoir dans l'économie mondiale. This book, which opens with a chapter devoted to the concept of power. This book uh, underlines the impossibility today of drawing borders between politics and economics. And I am not able, and I have no time to engage here in the details of her analysis, which I found find very interesting. But it's also interesting to note that Susan Strange's conception of the international political economy is generally contested by economists and by political scientists as well. I believe that the main reason for this resistance lies in the rigidity of the divisions between academic disciplines. Uh, as, I, as I have already indicated, I would not speak like Susan Strange of a retreat of the state, or I would be very precautious with this kind of terminology. Of terminology. But I agree with her that we need a concept of power that is both broad and differentiated in order to understand the way the human world is structured today. This concept is necessary to conceive a realistic, democratic, cosmopolitanism. As I have underlined, the struggle for equal rights must be at the core of this cosmopolitanism. This struggle must take into account First, the ambiguity of the power, singular. Secondly, the heterogeneity of powers, plural. That means that it must identify or uh, recognize the powers that influence our lives in their diversity, and it must distinguish between the powers with which the only possible relation is <coughs> confrontation and those that can offer willingly or under pressure the guarantee that rights require to become effective. Thank you for your attention.